Yeah, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how. Okay, you're gonna just have to do it without seeing her. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Zashina. I'm the curator at the Rochester Center. First of all, a bit of housekeeping. So this talk is going to be recorded. Um, hopefully it's fine for everyone who's here. If you have an issue with that, you can email me. Um, and uh, we will have time for questions after the talk. And in the meanwhile, if you can keep yourself muted. I'm here. You said that would be great. <laughs> um, and yeah. I think we have Corinne's iPad. Um, if you can mute yourself, that would be great. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, if you, you might need to, to mute the one that says Wayne, because I'm not sure how they're on. Yeah. I don't know if you can do that, Zoe, or. Um, maybe Amy. Yeah. Oh, there just, it is. Just muted, so. Yeah. <laughs> Jimmy. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, so the show, like Roots show, um, it's going to be up until November 8, uh, 28th at the Art Center. Uh, if you want more info here, I'm going to post about the show in the chat. Uh, in one second. Here you go. And um, I'm just going to get, yeah, postcard is there. Look at that. Great. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm just going to briefly introduce Ruth, uh, and then we will let to like some questions and then I hope you can jump in with some more questions. So Ruth Mayhus is a contemporary painter who lives and works in Rochester, Minnesota, actually just moved, but that it's not updated. Uh, our thought provoking paintings pay homage to times gone by and the intangible nature of memory. Her distinctive personal style emits joy, nostalgia, and longing for a simple time. An assortment of commonplace, often discarded objects from the past are brought to life through striking compositions and contrasting, contrasting yet harmonizing color combinations. The ninth of ten, uh, the ninth of ten children. Um, Ruth was immersed in a world of imagination at a young age. Her mother introduced her to an, the enticing world of creativity, the joy of a good story, sewing dolls, clothes, building dollhouse miniatures, music travel, Broadway shows, quilting, and antiquing, which her, madden, her mother lovingly referred to as junking. Her influence include her mother, uh, Theodore Geisel, Beverly, clearly, Joel Peter Whitkin, Cindy Sherman, Doug and Mike Stern, Christian Boltanski, and Rebecca Ains. Uh, she also had um, the good fortune to work with the original Blue Man Group in New York City in the early 90s. Mike has earned a Bachelor in Art of Arts in Photography from the University of Northern Iowa. And after college, she relocated to Brooklyn, New York, where she earned a Master of Fine Arts from Pratt Institute. She's also the recipient of an emerging uh, artist grant from uh, the Southeastern Minnesota Arts Council. And that it's actually supporting her exhibition. So our exhibition building uh, collection to connect um, is um, builds on the artist's childhood memory um, and explores why something that is disposable to one person can be indispensable to another. Um, what is the connection between the collector and the collection? And why interviewing uh, collectors, uh, a common theme emerged for Ruth, connection. So connection to the past, to a family they wanted to preserve and to people who have touched their lives. These collections are not mere objects. They're portraits to another place, another time, and they're a glimpse into a life story. Uh, so this exhibition is part of our Ruder program uh, that it's open to artists living uh, in the 11 counties surrounding Rochester. Um, and um, for artists who have received the CMAC grant, the Southeastern Minnesota Arts Council grant, um, the Ruder program supplies, um, like it, it, it exemplifies the commitment of the Art Center to be a central hub for art made in this region. 
Um, so uh, thank you for <laughs> thank you for like listening to this very long introduction. And here we go with some questions about Ruth's work. Um, so why don't you tell a bit about your background as a photographer and what brought you to painting? And how do you explore the theme of nostalgia in previous and current work? Okay, well, first, I just want to thank everybody for being here. And thank you, Zoe and Rochester Arts Center. And of course, the Southeastern Arts Council for funding the project. Um, it's nice to see so many familiar faces. <laughs> Um, my art education background, uh, majority was in photography. I studied photography at the University of Northern Iowa, and then again at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Um, and I was drawn to photography immediately, mostly because you had something immediate. You know, it wasn't, you didn't have to build from a blank canvas. Plus it was magical. To me, it was very magical that all of a sudden something would appear when before nothing was there. And I had a lot of fun with um, not so much the technical aspect of it. My education was more um, exploring it as an art. And in that would be more in expressing yourself and the way you see the world. And it really, working with photography taught me to see the world in a different way. Because when you're taking a photograph, you're not really participating in what's happening you kind of um, become a little bit removed from it and you're able to look at things a little differently. So I would say photography gave me really a whole new way to see the world. And I explored photography a lot with um, non-traditional means. I would do a lot of um, things like purposely leaking light into the camera or while I was developing film or even while I was developing prints, especially with color, just to see what would happen. And what I loved about things like that is you could never replicate it. So that's what I mean where I wasn't really interested in the technical um, as to how to reproduce something exactly uh, the same again and again and again. I wanted something different to happen each time. And that sort of slowly progressed to actually marking on negatives so that when I printed those marks would show up and then with color, messing with color on the negative itself and scratching on the negative and printing through things like gl glass. And, and then it progressed even to once the photograph was done, I started painting on the photographs themselves and ripping the photographs apart and reorganizing them and putting different photographs together or several of the same photograph at different sizes together. Um, so that's kind of where I ended up in painting is I was already doing a lot of non-conventional means. And then as photography went very digital um, and everybody was doing stuff in the computer, that didn't interest me as much. I was more interested in physically interacting and kind of the, you know, the magic of it. And with computer, I mean, it's great. You can get in Photoshop, you can replicate the same thing a thousand times. Um, but I missed the magic of it. And with painting, I kind of found the magic again, because I didn't really know what was going to happen when I put paint down. Um, and mostly I paint with palette knives. I don't use a lot of brushes and I do a lot of layers. So I'll start with an underpainting and build from there. I'll do a sketch and then paint over that and underpainting and then paint over that again and over that again and over that again to build up the thickness and also allow me to scrape back through um, to reveal something that was there before. Um, but that's kind of the process I use when I'm actually painting. And that's kind of how I got to it is just wanting to get engaged again directly with the surface as opposed to just sitting on, you know, staring at a computer screen. Um, and then specifically with nostalgia, I'm very nostalgic. I mean, it comes naturally to me. I really can't, probably couldn't get away from it if I tried. Um, and a lot of that has to do with growing up, a lot of my family's here on the call, but growing up in a big family, there's just a lot of, you know, a lot of interactions with all different age groups, all, all different kinds of people. And I have a lot of good memories of what it was like to grow up in an environment like that. And so with this project, um, I specifically, because I grew up with a mother who took me to antique shows and antique stores and all kinds of crazy junking 
adventures. I'm a collector, but I believe we're all collectors, whether you're collecting photographs um, or, and it started with most of us from childhood, whether you had, you know, the McDonald's Happy Meal toy, you got the first one, and then you had to have the next one and the next one. And then, you know, you had to have the complete set that a lot of us or baseball cards, or we had wacky packages. If you were a kid of the seventies, um, all those kind of things. And I, and what that was, is it was a way to bring us together. It was a common experience. And so what I've learned through collecting is and in interviewing these collectors is they all kind of have that sense of nostalgia to some degree, and they all want that connection and they find it in with each other. I mean, it's amazing because they have this commonality, the shared experience of something, a love of the past, or it, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be the same thing. You could be a collector of, I don't know, antique toys, or you could be a collector of antique coins. It doesn't really matter. You're collectors and, and they sh seem to share that commonality and that bond and they share stories, but more than anything, it just seems to bring people together and it ties them to the past. It ties them to each other. I mean, I was even, I've actually done some reading about how um, that kind of bond can bring like a release of oxytocin, which again, just ties more people. It's more bonding experience and social. So it's been fascinating. Um, learning all that. Cause I myself have been a collector and you kind of wonder why do you do it? And a lot of it is, it's just finding that connection to other people and other things and other times. And most of these collectors also see themselves as a preserver of the past, which is interesting. They don't want things to disappear. They want them to stay around. They want people to remember um, what was important at one time, whether it was important to them or important to somebody before them. Um, it's, so it was very fascinating for me. So hopefully that answered that question in a very long way. <laughs> That's great. I think it touches also like some of the um, like next questions. But um, so a collection is defined as uh, the action or process of collecting someone or something, uh, but also as a group of things or people. So in your experience, did you find that people interested in similar collect or like collecting similar objects or people or experiences do also share backgrounds or like styles and values? Yeah, I would say it's a lot of what I was saying before is, um, you know, again, in America, we grow up with things like McDonald's and the McDonald toys or baseball cards or anything like that. And I think that ties people sort of a, gives them something in common from a very young age, whether it's a toy or an experience, whatever that is. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I guess that that's, that's, and it's autobiographical. I think our autobiographical, if I can say that word, um, you know, just something it's, it's your life a little bit to some extent. And I think people have that um, there, there's nostalgia for that. Um, and, and telling their story and how these things relate to their story and become part of their story and how they can share that with others. Um, so that just builds different communities and ties people together. I mean, it's just, that's what was the fascinating thing for me to, was really the connection for this. Um, yeah, and I, yeah. It's the same thing. It's the same things we did when we were a kid. We're doing as adults, we're just bigger. Um, maybe people now collect cars or, you know, we've, and I'm in a group that collects a lot of old advertising. Um, so it's a similar thing. You know, maybe we've traded up from uh, McDonald land toys to advertising or who knows what, but it, and it's part of our culture. I think it's, as Americans, anyway, we seem to be tied to uh, all this kind of pop culture. And it, I, I believe it just comes from your childhood and how we grew up, which I'm sure for you, it's very different growing up. I believe you grew up in Italy, so I'm sure it's very, very different. Yeah, but it's like, I don't know. I think it just America has, has some, it's like some objects are like very iconic, right? 
and there's uh, like a specific like art like field right like pop art that made them even more iconic and so it, it was I, I, yeah I think I told you that like in one of the questions that when looking at your work it just has an American vibe to me and maybe you know very very the idea of like nostalgia and how it's tied to objects that then talk about community and memories from childhood really it's, it's really uh, clear uh, um, I think I'm going to move to like ask you about the story behind one of your paintings um, if you have want to tell us about your process for interviewing these collectors that I know was a little different that what you expected because of pandemic and this project um, and if you want to talk about you know your choice for colors uh, if they represent anything for the objects that you are um, they painting and yeah just a bit about your process uh, well with the interviewing I mean the first thing is because I uh, go to shows and belong to various collecting groups and um, so I, I had no shortage of people that I could call upon um, so I was lucky that way and luckily the people I did approach were open to it I think at first they might have been a little bit like what do you, you know, may, maybe a little bit nervous about, you want to see my collection? You know, that's, that's kind of invasive to get into somebody's house and see everything they have. And um, so I was very, very lucky that so many people were so generous with opening um, their homes, literally, to me. And it did change a little bit during the pandemic. I ended up doing some interviews via the phone, um, just because of the comfort level of, you know, people weren't sure if they should be that close together or whatever. But basically what I would do is I would meet with someone. Um, well, first I'd approach them and ask them, you know, do you, would you be willing to tell me your story? Because oftentimes just in, I tend to chat with people anyway. So if I was at a show or just happened to meet somebody um, and just started talking and they would tell me something that would spark my interest and say, uh, there's something interesting here. It isn't just about objects or there, there's a, I can sense there's some sort of story here. So um, I would meet with that person if I was lucky enough to get you know into their home or meet with them in person so I could see their collection in person. Um, mostly it was just conversational. I just wanted them to tell me about what they had. And what was very interesting is oftentimes what someone was collecting now um, you know, I was what I was interested in. How did you get started doing this? What is the story? What what got you down this path? And um, I actually see. I think Jeff is on this call, and uh, one of the paint. So one of the paintings, the bottle painting, which is on the postcard, um, is his. And it, I was fascinated because when I got to his house, I mean, Jeff has an amazing collection of Dairy Queen. I mean, every advertising, and I was just in awe. You know, that, that Mr. Misty machine, I just can't get it out of my mind, Jeff. <laughs> um, so it was a lot of fun. And then just starting to talk to him about, you know, how did you, you know, just uncovering, I was probably there a couple hours and just trying to uncover what, you know, where I did, like I just started. And then he was telling me the story, which is in his story online, which I could read to you if you like. Um, about how he was on the beach down in Florida with his aunts and they were digging for bottles. And, you know, so we started talking and I said to him, well, do you still have this bottle? You know, I mean, this is probably 40 years ago. I don't know. And he did. And to me, that means something. Why are you keeping that for so many years? You know, all those memories and it's just to see where it led him and all the friends he's made and all the adventures he's had and all the connections. I mean, it was just, so it was really fun to have that long conversation. And he's got this amazing collection of all these things today. But to me, it boiled down to that one afternoon on the beach with his aunts with the bottle. And, you know, I mean, it's, that's a part like for the nostalgia for me is I just, I love that kind of stuff. And the fact that he still had it, I was, oh, it just, killed me. So that's what's featured in that painting. And I can, I think, let's see if I share my screen. Um, that's um, on the left there, the bottle. Hopefully you're all seeing that. That's the bottle. And then the lighthouse is in the background. And that is from what I understand, the Ponce de Leon lighthouse down in Florida, um, where they actually did the digging. 
So that's kind of how that all came about. I mean, it's kind of in some reason, in some ways, it's a little funny that he's got this amazing collection. And, and of all things I paint for him is the bottle. But to me, that's kind of where the heart is. And that's what's connected, you know, that that thread that went through his whole life, the experience he had there on the beach um, with his family. And so that's kind of how the, the interview would go. And then with the painting, so I knew when he said he still had that bottle and he was willing to pull it out for me, um, I took a picture of the bottle. I took several pictures of the bottle and that's kind of where it started. And then I just, when I was reflecting on um, the interview with him later and starting the painting, it just, you know, the colors, there was just something sweet about it. And the photograph itself, when I took it, there was this beautiful reflection happening on it. And so I captured some of that. And the colors just kind of grew from really more the emotion of it. And actually, it, this had been painted a few times. And I kept kind of going over it again and over it again and over it again. And that's a process I learned um, at Pratt with a professor I had there is he's, don't be precious. You know, don't be precious with something like if you think it's where you want it to be and you're afraid to touch it, do more, go farther. And so that's what what I did here. And that's when the bottle started to disappear a little bit where you'd see behind it. And I like the idea of that, because to me, that reminded me more of a memory where it's not 100 percent tangible. You can kind of see it in your mind's eye, but it's not it's probably not what it really was. And it probably you know, it's a little skewed, your memory, as much as you think you have a, a perfect picture of what it was. And so that's the intangible nature of memory was a little bit of what I was trying to capture in that as well. Um, and the colors just kind of lent itself to that. And I wanted the lighthouse to be there. It just seemed part of that was composition um, and balance for the, for the image itself or for the painting. And but that's really how that all kind of unfolded. And I'm trying to think, I believe that was the very first painting that I did too. And he might've been the first interview. Um, so that's maybe stuck with me more than anything because I really didn't know when I started how this was gonna go. Are people gonna be willing to open up? How is that gonna go? Um, are they gonna be guarded? And I found with him that um, he was, I felt he was very open with me and I felt very, uh, honored to have that. And, and so that's, I was very happy with how the painting turned out and I'll show it again. Um, you can see like the different quadrants. I just kind of like that. A lot of that was just compositionally. Um, but it felt to me like a beach, like a bottle on the beach. Um, but at the same time, it was, it kind of was disappearing a little bit. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of it, when I paint, it's very uh, intuitive. I don't, like, like I didn't sit down ahead of time and sketch it out and say, I'm gonna do a bottle here and a lighthouse there. And I just started doing the bottle and it actually kept growing in size. It wasn't originally gonna take up that much of the space. And so that's part of the painting on top of painting on top of painting until it felt right. And the colors are kind of that way too. It's just sort of intuitive. I do often choose contrasting colors or complementary colors, which um, if you're not familiar, those are just kind of opposites to give you contrast. So I will often do that just to give a little more visual interest or a little bit of um, tension, which I like. And some sometimes it's purposeful and sometimes not. Sometimes it's just, oh, this is what feels like it needs to be there. Um, and again, that's just part of the intuition. So I would say that's where that kind of comes from. But that was really my process with everybody is just trying to have a very conversational kind of interview. I didn't, when I first went in, I had questions written down, but most of the time I didn't even, I just let the conversation take me. Where did they want to, what did they want to tell me about? You know, people like to talk. Uh, that's what I find. And I think they're happy to have someone to listen. And I loved listening to all the stories. It was a lot of fun. Um, I probably could have done another 10 or 20 more, especially if we didn't have COVID, it would have been a lot of fun. Um, and one of the things I enjoyed too, was putting the story with the painting. It was fun to be able to 
um, incorporate that because I, I guess I, I love reading and I never realized how much I in, enjoy the writing part of it as well. So it was a lot of fun to pair the two and to try to get the story condensed to where I think you got the feeling of it um, without being too, you know, you didn't need to know every single detail, um, but the gist of it, I guess. So hopefully that came across in the story. So you can let me know if you want. Um, I don't know if everybody's familiar. I can read. I've got the stories here. If you want me to read uh, the story I wrote for Jeff or for one of the other paintings. I think it'd be uh, great. I was trying to like copy and paste it, but it doesn't seem to work. Maybe it's like very like too long for Zoom. So yeah, yeah, it could be. Well, let me, I'll put the painting back up. Or at least it's right next to. So this is the bottle painting. And it's actually, the painting is just entitled Bottle. And then this is what I wrote. Um, Jeff, you'd like Jeff. He has an easy smile and he's the kind of person that remembers your name. He's a country store historian and preservationist with a large collection of country store artifacts. His personal collection was the featured exhibit Old Country Store at the Red Wing Pottery Museum. I can imagine that Jeff would have been a popular country store owner. He is easy to talk to and generous with his time. When I asked him how he got started collecting, he recalled an aunt and uncle that collected Victorian pattern glassware and an aunt who worked at the Gluck office and had a large collection of cans. He credits her for his appreciation of the art of advertising and his interest in old wooden boxes with colorful advertising labels. Jeff has been photographing and documenting all the wood boxes in his collection and plans to write a book complete with history and photographs, including the care and preservation of these early advertising artifacts from the 1870s up to World War II. He continued to share stories and told me of a trip to Florida when he was about 10. He traveled with his family to visit an aunt and uncle during the Daytona 500. His dad and uncle went to the race, but Jeff wasn't interested. He preferred to go with the ladies to the Ponce de Leon Lighthouse Inlet. He enjoyed seeing the lighthouse and spotting jellyfish and snakes before continuing on to explore a kind of prehistoric trash dump of discarded materials to dig for treasure. Jeff remembers finding two glass bottles there dating back to the 1800s. He told me he still had one of the bottles he found that day, so I asked to see it. It is featured in this painting. So that's the, that's an idea of what the stories were that went along with these various paintings. Um, and that is the one of Bottle. And the story Thank is you. Oh, you're welcome. So there's a, uh, I think, new Sharon, I hope I'm saying his name right. Uh, ask if you can discuss some other of your paintings. I think this this format it's actually really great. Like seeing the painting and like viewing, viewing the story and your back story and how like they came together, right? Um, yeah, and, and how it all came together. Let me see if I can pull up another painting. Well, I could even do the painting that's next to it. Right. That might be easy. Um, then people feel free to like jump in with questions in the chat oh I just have, I have a quick question yeah hi can you hear me yeah totally hi I'm sorry I'm jumping late I just came out from um school and I'd be like shoot zoom it's at six o'clock I'm jumping like a little 15 or 20 minute late but, oh no I missed the detail and I really like and enjoy your paintings, your bottle and like when I see the image it just like capture my attention I always like why is that vod like a like a bottle next to the lighthouse? Is it mean something? You know, it's kind of, and then the color that make me think. You know, be like, why is she doing this color and this color? Just like questioning why I'm looking at the painting, and when I kind of like read a little bit of story and hold up to you like presented like what what it's represent. I was like that. It's real cool. It's kind of connected a little bit to my story. He's instead of he collecting water bottle, I collected aluminum cans, a pop of cans, you know, like a Pepsi, um, any of those you know, to sell it for a couple of dollars or something, you know, back then, I don't know, like two, when I came here, 2012, my dad and I, like a family, we be collecting those just for a couple, I don't know, money bucks. <laughs> Well, that's great. Here you go. You find another collector, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I, there's a lot you're of like them a, out there. It's wonderful. You're a magnet. It's just, <laughs> like, 
it's relatable. It's just like, wow. Well, thank Almost. you, Sasa, for your feedback. It's great. Yes, um, I'm Kelly. Kind of missed the detail, but at the end of the Zoom, can you send the Zoom to me so I can lessen the the previews? Is that okay? Yeah, we will post uh, uh we will post it on uh, Roots um page web page on the R Center. So I'm just reposting this so you can look here. You'll find the link to the to the artist talk. Okay, sounds yeah. good. Thank you. Um. So yeah, why don't we go ahead to the next painting? Okay, let me do another one. Let me pull this. Look at the stories next year. Okay, this is, I'll do a different one. Let's do this one. Let's see, are you seeing the tractor painting there? Okay, and this one, um, this is, so the painting's just entitled Tractor. And the interview was with Charlie. Okay, so the story is Charlie. Charlie's been in training to be a collector his whole life. He was an only child and spent lots of time with his grandmother and he loved it. He told me she never threw anything away and recalled her buying things brand new and hiding them away in the house. He particularly remembered her buying a blue Ertle toy tractor. She showed it to him but told him he couldn't play with it and, he quickly, and she quickly hid it away. After she passed, his uncle moved on to the farm. He didn't want all the stuff she had collected, so Charlie packed up all of her treasures and moved them to his house in town. He picked out what he wanted to keep and held a garage sale to sell the rest. An antique store owner happened to come to the sale and invited him to an auction. Charlie loved the auction, and this got him into buying and selling himself. Long, not long after he'd packed everything up and moved it off his grandparents' farm, Charlie's uncle died unexpectedly. The farm was now his, so he repacked what was left of his grandmother's things and moved back out to the farm. Charlie began to notice that his grandmother had stashed things away in odd places throughout the house. One day while exploring an unfinished attic space, he spotted something behind an unused heating grate. He removed the grate to find a metal box filled with sewing supplies. Not exciting, but under that box was the blue Ertl toy tractor his grandmother had purchased and hidden all those years ago. That toy tractor appears in the painting along with the door to that attic space. So again, this is, um, I just love that story. I mean, when he told me that, cause he remembered her buying it when she was, when he was little and he couldn't play with it. And then all these years later, he ends up living there and she had literally hidden it under some floorboards. I mean, that's just the craziest story. Um, but it's, it's no wonder that he's gotten bit by this bug and now he buys and sells, but he still got that tractor. Um, he had some old pedal cars that were his uncles that were really neat. So that was one of the interviews that I did um, over, over the phone because that was in the middle of COVID. But um, just another fascinating story and just so much fun. Like who, like what a great grandmother to have. I mean, aside the fact that he couldn't play with the toy, but the fact that she'd buy things and hide them and just thought, I don't know if she thought they'd be worth something someday. Unfortunately, she's gone. So we can't ask her what she was thinking, but that was another, I mean, all these interviews were fun to do, but that one was just when he told me that he found it under the floorboards, I just was like, oh my God. And then he still had it, you know, and it was in the original packaging. He still hadn't opened it up. <laughs> I just thought it was a lot of fun. So with that painting, it was really more trying to figure out how do I convey that kind of, um, let's see if I can share this again. Um, kind of, to me, it's sort of a discovery. Um, that's what I was trying. I really wanted to get, not, I didn't want it to just be the toy train. Like the, I wanted it to, our toy tractor, I wanted it to be a little bit of a mystery or story. So when he, he actually sent me pictures of, um, the, tr the tractor and he sent me pictures of the attic door. So I modified it a little bit to make everything work together. But again, in this one, I kind of amplified the uh, angle at the left and the color behind the tractor. Again, that's a contrasting color just to really make it pop um, and make you wonder like, what the heck, why is this tractor coming out of this door? Um, so just having some fun playing with that. And so I enjoyed, I enjoyed this one a lot. The story was a lot of fun and, and figuring out what to, 
how to convey. That's again, that's something I just sort of had to use my intuition. Like, how is that gonna, and I don't, you know, it, it's tough when you're so close to these stories and the painting itself is to know how is it going to come across? And hopefully it comes across um, a little bit mysterious and, you know, why would a tractor be coming out of a door, but um, just trying to make it a little bit fun at the same time. So that was that story. I think you succeeded. That was my first question is why is that tractor partially hidden? <laughs> well, at least you can tell it's a tractor and that it's hidden. That's good because that's what she did with it. I just, it's just the funniest when he told me that I couldn't believe it. I mean, the whole fact that he, you know, his uncle wanted everything out of the house and then the uncle dies. So he ends up moving out there and, and it's still there after all those years, still hidden. Just crazy. Would have been a fun, you know, it's fun kind of treasure hunt in that house. Um, this, this may not have been your objective, but did you, did you go back and show these paintings to the to the collectors and kind of ask them, you know, did this capture the moment or the feeling like when you found that tractor that you had been deprived of as a small child, you know, I, mean, I don't know if that's what you were <laughs> capturing exactly what they were feeling as opposed to conveying it to everybody else. But I'm, I'm curious whether you showed these to sort of the subjects and, and kind of got their impressions of them. Um, I've shown, well, they've all been uh, sent information. Some replied, some didn't. Um, so, you know, but it kind of depended on, on their, that wasn't an objective. That wasn't an objective. And I will say I was a little nervous about it because, you know, I, they didn't know, you know, they're telling me their story and they really have no idea what I'm going to zero in on. Um, so, yeah, I will say I was I was a little nervous about doing that because I, I don't know maybe that's my I wanted them to like it I wanted them to feel, uh, you know, honored a little bit about what I did that I didn't know so I, um, so no I haven't specifically solicited uh, reaction from any of them but um, I did send the responses I've gotten so far have been good like they they enjoyed the painting they enjoyed the story you know, I enjoyed the colors that they picked that I selected for it. And, um, but no, that wasn't, that's interesting. I guess maybe I was a little nervous to do that. Nervous the, of what, how they would respond because they're not artists. I mean, that was an interesting thing too. This is a group of people that, I mean, not entirely, but for the most part, they, they are not involved in the art world. They're not people that are likely to go to museums. Um, a couple of them, I would say would, but on the whole, no. So, I mean, they appreciate different things, but uh, I'm not sure that art is something that they're as comfortable with or that they're going to um, seek out by any means, which was another reason I wanted to approach some of these people just to see. Um, it was interesting when I would talk to them and say, I'm an artist, I'm going to be doing a painting based on your story. And some, some were kind of like, you know, why would you want to do that? Or, um, or some were flattered. Some didn't seem to care one way or the other. Oh, that's fine. You know? Um, so yeah, it wasn't my number one objective, but it, that is something I should probably just let go of my worry about the judgment and see what happens. It's kind of fun. I think I we have time. Oh, oh sorry. I have a question. question. How long does it take you to paint each picture? You know, like each, like a square like that, you know, how long does it take you to paint it? Um, I, typic I typically work on three or four paintings at a time because I work in oil. So things stay wet and I'll go back and forth. Plus it gives me time. I tend to work because I work more intuitively. I work for a little while and then I kind of get the feeling, eh, time to stop, you know, walk away a little bit. So I would say, I mean, if you just counted start to finish, it would probably be like five or six days. Um, but most of these probably took three or four weeks just because I was working on things simultaneously. And I like that. I like stepping away because sometimes um, you don't really know, like something's not working or uh, you're not sure. 
which way to go and just time can make all the difference. Just walking away or working on something else or going for a walk or whatever an idea can come to you. So yeah, that's always a hard question to ask because I don't work one, I don't work very linearly or is that the word? I don't even know if that's a word. <laughs> um, so, but it's funny, I kind of credit my mom was a quilter and she would work on a couple of quilts at the same time and she'd have them laid on the beds. And I can remember a few times where she'd come to me and she'd say, well, you look at this quilt. She'd just have it laid out and there would be different blocks everywhere. And she says, something's wrong, something's wrong. And we'd just stand there and look. And I'd say, well, what if you move that there? And, that, and that we would, so I learned a lot from my mom just doing that. Like she knew something was wrong and we looked at it and something's off but you don't really know, maybe you can't even explain it. It's just a, a feeling. So it's a very similar process. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> I don't know. It does. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I think we have time for like another question or another story before we go. Let's hear another story. Yeah, let's you hear another story. That's great. Let's see. Should I do um should I do Judy's story? Let's see if I can find the picture. Um the family will enjoy this one because my sister was the last interview I did. Let's see if I can find that. There it is. Open. Okay. So this one. Okay, so that painting is called South Dakota. Um, and let's see, and this story, Judy. Judy is my sister and we've done a lot of antiquing together. So when I asked her to tell me what she remembered, I expected that I already knew her story, but I didn't. Judy was the first of 10 children and 16 years older than me. I found she had a completely different childhood experience. She remembers lots of fun overnight trips to our grandparents, Mimi and Papa, with the older kids and cousins. The entire house was a fun place to be, and the basement was a child's paradise. Huge open space, complete with toys and a built-in slide. Even I remember that. One of those toys was her uncle's old Hercules Ferris wheel wind-up tin toy. Judy has it now, and it's one of her great treasures and a reminder of all the fun times she had there. When I asked her if she remembered the first thing she collected, she thought for a moment and told me the story of a special vacation to the Black Hills, just her and brother Jerry alone with mom and dad. She recalled the trip in detail and even had a travel diary typed up by mom to summarize their daily activities. It details picnic lunches, theme parks, buffalo sightings, cave and mine tours, a helicopter ride, a train ride, a zoo, museums, theater productions, a chairlift, cloudburst storms, and beautiful scenery. Judy and Jerry were each treated to a couple of souvenirs along the way, and Judy chose two Native American dolls. She still has those dolls, and they are featured in this painting, along with her uncle's Hercules Ferris wheel wind-up tin toy. So that, that was a really fun interview to do because it was my sister and I didn't really know. It's hard because you make so many, I have so many assumptions that I already knew everything. Um, and she did a lot of antiquing, junking uh, with my mom, probably even more than I did. I mean, I did it when I was really young, just getting you know, dragged along. Um, my brother Rob and I would get in the car with our pillows and mom and drive us off to some crazy place. And we'd have a lot of fun. It was very mysterious. Uh, but Judy did it more as an adult. So I figured I knew that. So it was really fun. I had no idea about the South Dakota trip. And the fact that she still had the diary um, that mom wrote out. I mean, it was just crazy. All the detail. And I had no idea that she had these dolls. And when I, you know, she said she remembered getting them. And I, you know, said, oh, Judy, do you still have that? And she's like, oh, yes, I do and pulled them out. And this is, these are the two that she had. And in the background, you can see the Ferris wheel. Now I altered the color of that to make it stand out more that Ferris wheel is actually more like a yellow mustardy color. Um, and then did 
you know, the outline of South Dakota in the back. And I kind of purposely used a little bit of a turquoise color just because of the Native American theme in there. Um, but this one was a lot of fun to do for, first of all, I love toys. So the painting was fun. Um, but just the fact that it was my sister and getting to interview her, it was a lot of fun because when I sat down to interview her at her house, you know, she has a beautiful collection of toys and all kinds of neat things. And um, her husband was there and she said, to him, go away. And I just, I love that. Like she didn't want him there and that, you know, maybe she didn't want him interrupting or, or whatever it was, but it was just a lot of fun um, to just sit with her and have this conversation and to hear this whole story because, because there's such a big age difference. We did have a totally um, different childhood. They were both really good, just very different. So it this one was a lot of fun for me. Um, and, and I did think I should probably, everybody in the family, not necessarily with collections and it'd be fun to do a painting of everybody and see what they turn out to be. But that was a fun one. And the colors, again, I, I specifically used some contrasting, um, pretty crazy colors just to, to make that one pop. So that was a lot of fun. So, um, I guess maybe one last question. Uh, what is going to happen next? What do you have? Like, what's your future project? And what's going to happen to this body of work? Are you like keeping working on it, extending it? Well, I, you know, I don't know what will I think, I don't know what will happen with this body of work. I may um, see if it, if it, if anyone else is in, interesting in, sh in showing it as a collection, but um What's interesting is I really enjoyed writing the stories. So that's something that I'm, the current project I'm working on, you can see a little bit in the back, is I'm working on paintings of old stuffed animals. So most of them were old carnival toys. And just again, playing with that idea of memory and um, nostalgia. And But what I'm doing with these guys is I'm specifically, they're each kind of developing a personality. So part of what's going to come from this previous, um, the grant exhibit is the storytelling. So I'm working on developing a story for each of the characters that are emerging from this. So I've got about nine paintings started. Nobody's finished. I just keep working on them in various stages and traveling's making that a little bit difficult, but so that's what's happening currently. Um, so we'll see to be determined, I guess. And I did on my website, I've, I've started putting pictures of the works in progress so people can see from the sketch, like the various, I've started just taking snapshots as I work because you'll see one painting and then it completely disappears and something else comes up or part of it's still there or new characters come up. Um, so I'm having, a, I'm just having a lot of fun with it. But so we'll see But the storytelling, I think, is coming out. I didn't realize how much I was going to enjoy that. So that was a fun discovery, I guess, from this grant exhibit, how much I enjoyed that. Well, I just wanted to add that as the person looking at the piece, the story adds a tremendous amount to it. I, I love that. And you have a fantastic narrating voice. Oh. <laughs> in the future, you could use that in your, your work too. do the actual narrations. I love it should be a voiceover artist <laughs> right the grad school question what if it was sound right yeah yeah well, I do. it's very important like I want to convey emotion I want to make somebody feel something so whether it's with the words or the painting or the combination that's important to me so there is that whole idea of the immersion yeah I could see doing something that was almost like an installation I've thought about maybe doing murals. That's something else. Like doing these really large. I love, like right now, this guy behind me, he's not very big. He's like 12 by 16 or something, but I would love to do him like 16 feet by 12 feet, but I'm not sure how I would ever make that happen, but it, it's interesting. It's so all of this has sparked a lot of different ideas. We'll just see where they go, how they unfurl. Well, I think we all look forward to see more and hopefully see a giant version of one of your paintings. <laughs> right. right. Massive. Uh, thank you so much for sharing about mm -hmm. your process and some insights about 
um, how this project kind of came to be. And thank you everybody for being here again. Uh, this We will post the recording on our website and you can just look for Root My Hoods and you'll find the link there. Thank you so Perfect. much. Thank Great you. job, Ruth. You're Ruth. Right here. Thank you. Did you know I was here, Ruth? Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't know you were there, John. <laughs> I've been trying to unmute this. It's probably lucky that it, I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was thoroughly enjoyable, and it's so interesting, you know. I was in the furniture business, and people oh. buy display cabinets, and I've right. seen these people that collect salt and pepper shakers, rhinoceroses, giraffes so that brought you know i mean it is it's crazy what they collect but it's, you know very interesting well thank you i appreciate that uh ruth do you sell your painting at all um they are for sale um all the ones almost all the ones in the gallery exhibit are for sale there's a couple like the one that i did for judy is not for sale or the one for myself um but I do, and the, these ones that I'm working on now will be for sale. They're just, they're still in progress. So um, if you keep an eye on the website, I, I will definitely list them, but you can see the progress of them as they are for now. So once they're finished, I'll have those on there. One of the problems now is I'm in the middle of a move to New Mexico. So it's been a little difficult to stay with the painting while, while living out of various rentals and moving around a lot. I'm homeless right now, basically. <laughs> it's okay. At least you're in a warm weather. Yes, warm Good, and better sunny. Place, better place to be homeless. <laughs> uh, if somebody's interested in the paintings, can send us an email at what is it? Info at artcenter.org, Pam. Um, on price, like with questions about the the price and how to get the painting after the show yep. is done. Info we'll come to you at rochesterartcenter.org. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Amy. Yeah. Great. And come and see the show. It's open until November 28th. I think I went there to see your painting, though. Bought a bottle and the light. Just went to the art center. <laughs> Great. Thank you.